Greetings subscribers and other curious persons. Welcome to another vlog inspired by the Goodreads Tuesday Talks group. Uh, this week's topic is how do you feel about comparative blurbs on book covers? Well, I'm going to assume they mean blurbs in the sense of author quotes rather than blurbs in the sense of book descriptions. And so I'll be talking about books that are, for example, described as a cross between Tolkien and King. Now, my initial thought about comparisons is that it's a natural part of the human mind. The human mind is fundamentally a pattern-seeking, iterative structure. We start off in life by experiencing millions of things we've never experienced before and the mind tries to put them into groups, into sets, to work out if A has been followed by B three times, is it going to be followed, is A going to be followed by B next time? We build models of the world this way. So it's almost, well, not quite hardwired, but certainly right down at the very boundary between things that are actually part of the human structure and social creation is pattern seeking. So I don't think comparing books to other books is something that we're going to ever get away from. I don't think there's really uh, going to be a sudden revolution in which we suddenly decide to stop comparing one thing to another or comparing one book to another. So I think they're a fundamental part of the social life of all readers. Now, and I also think they're convenient. If you are handed a book and are told, do you think you'll like this book? You don't really know. But if someone hands you a book and says, you like Dan Abnett and this writer's like him, are you going to like this? You're going to make a much more informed decision without having to read the book. And you're likely to be close. I mean, there are situations in which you're not, but you are likely to be close. Uh, so comparative statements can be very helpful in letting a reader know if they have limited resources, whether of time or money, whether or not the book is a good investment. If you have a choice between a book that is described as being like Barbara Cartland and a book that's described as being like H.P. Lovecraft, most readers will, if they've only got time or money to have one of those books, be able to make a better decision than if they're presented with, you can have book A and you can have book B. Which one do you want? And that's the information you have. Now, obviously there are other tellers, the cover, there's a lot of patterns in cover, but again, that's kind of a comparative. Books that are similar tend to have similar covers. Writers who want the same audience, a particular author, as a particular genre, will tend to aim for a similar cover if they don't have a really strong image. Similarly with titles and so on, even to an extent with authors. And it's not as bad as it was when female authors had to publish under male pen names, but probably if you are writing military fiction, there is an advantage in having a military title. If you are writing cosy romance, there is an advantage in not having a military title. <laughs> so 
comparatives are, as I said, part of us as readers and a part of what we use to judge. But the downside is that comparatives are taking an infinitely complex world and reducing it down to a series of qualities that the person making the comparison has deemed as significant, key, major, whatever. And to reduce a million things down to a thousand is a huge reduction, but still it's a very nuanced picture. To take those thousand and reduce them down to a hundred, it's again, it's shrinking it down, but still a hundred different criteria, that's a very nuanced picture still. A hundred down to ten. Ten down to five. Suddenly we're starting to get a lot of the detail gone. And to take five down to two, so we've gone from millions right the way down to two qualities, we've got the problem that, well, those two labels are descriptors for this hugely complex thing, but they're descriptors used as a single thing. And then the intersection of those two, the person making the comparison knows which of the millions of qualities of author A and author B they are speaking about when they say a book is like a combination of author A and author B. But is the reader going to know? I mean, for instance, my it's a comparison of Tolkien and King. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. If he didn't start Western fantasy fiction, he is a huge founder of it. Uh, his influence is still felt. So if you describe a book as being like Tolkien, people will think maybe elves, quests evil lurking in the darkness, orcs, all that kind of thing. But also, Tolkien is known for his poor characterization of women. Some of his women are pretty much cardboard cutouts. Others of them have some agency, but it's only agency within a set of reactions to what the male characters are doing. But also Tolkien's work, uh, The Silmarillion, the things that his estate published after his death, are complex, sprawling and abstruse. So Tolkien could be either the archetype of Western fantasy, or it could be an old, archaic, lacking in modern nuance and agency form of fantasy. And similarly, Stephen King. He's a horror writer, but he's a particular kind of horror writer. So he does great things with ideas. He does great things if you like reading about Maine and that area of America. He has a very noticeable style. But one of the problems he has that I've talked about before, one of the problems my friends are aware of, and it's something that we've talked about before, and it is a problem that's impacted my reading of Stephen King pretty much ever since I encountered him. And as I say, my friends and I have sat around and discussed it, and it is a serious problem, and they agree it's a serious problem, and. The books they've read, they can cite examples of how it suffered from the problem as well. And the problem is there, and it's been there throughout the time I've been reading Stephen King. And periodically I come back to King and I'm reminded again of the problem because it is there. And it's not something I just imagined, it's there. Other people were there as well, and they are aware of this problem. And that problem is, of course, the fact that Stephen King doesn't tell you what the evil is straight away, which is good. But he does have a habit of refer having characters refer to things they've done in the past, 
not with enough evidence for readers to advance much, but in the way that the two characters refer to it so obliquely, you don't get a picture. And with the shorter books, that's not necessarily a problem. With some of his books, it doesn't really occur. But as is demonstrated by it, sometimes he can go on for hundreds and hundreds of pages with characters being terrified of this seminal moment in their past. Eight or nine characters who don't ever on page where the reader can see it give much more than a hint that there was a seminal event and that it happened somewhere where other people weren't around to corroborate it apart from these people who never speak about it in the reader's presence and so when you describe a book as like a mixture of tolkien and king you could either be talking about a very earthy working man's embedded in the community retake of western fantasy a combination of the best of the two of them or you could be talking about a book where the male characters go on repeatedly about the great evil that is lurking without ever actually giving the reader an idea of what it is or encountering it in any meaningful sense other than in some nebulous terror they experience. Whilst the female characters walk around merely being set dressing for the men to give their nebulous, unmeaningful horror that doesn't feel much to the reader against. So, comparative quotes on books are a very mixed blessing. If I know the person who's giving the quote, I can know potentially how they're going to use their comparators. And if I don't, then it's less meaningful to me because I can use it to say, well, if a book is like Barbara Cartland, if that's what someone said about it, it's not going to be a searing indictment of life in the Russian gulags written in Korean. But I can't, <clears throat> I can't necessarily say it's more than romance without knowing how that person views Barbara Cartland. And Barbara Cartland, probably you could take a reasonable stab at the value set that that would take. But with another author, it's hard to tell. And when you bring it down to a single thing, the, for instance, this book is a natural heir to H.P. Lovecraft. Well, if you look at the opus of H.P. Lovecraft films, at the one end, you've got the rubber masks and ketchup spray of Brian Yunzer. At the other end, you've got the almost minimalist the horror is sort of there of Die Farbe. But if someone says a book is like Lovecraft, are they saying that because it's a completely different style from Lovecraft, but it's got Cthulhu in it? Are they saying that because it's the natural heir to the Herbert West Lovecraft, so it's pulpy gore, or are they saying that because it's the natural heir to Lovecraft's sense of a universe that is dangerous not because it hates humanity, but because humanity is irrelevant to it, that you are tumbling into an abyss that doesn't actually notice you're there. So, 
I think that I think comparative quotes on the front of books are things that people will always have. But I also think that they're only ever going to be an approximation of one person's experience of the book. So compared to a one paragraph review or even a couple of sentences of review or a personal recommendation from someone that I know, they're not going to influence my choice. Ah, oh. toodaloo.